I'd like to welcome everyone. This is the New Orleans Peace uh, Coalition. New Orleans Peace Coalition is actually uh, grabbing hands with other leaders in our city of New Orleans to talk about and come up with strategies to deal with the violence that has occurred in our city. And we, today we have Richard Johnson. He's a, a life skills counselor at Carver. He's a minister. Uh, he's a friend, a leader of his family. And I really believe that he has a unique perspective today to uh, help us come up with some of these strategies. So welcome, Richard. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brother Dean. It's always, always a blessing to connect with you, man. So tell us a little bit about your work at Carver and, and what, what your heart is. Yeah, I specifically work with kids who have a 504 IEP, and I was moved into this role about two years ago. And so what I do is help kids make the transition from 11th grade to 12th grade, and then from 12th to either a career, uh, some kind of job career, or off to college, or both, which I try to encourage the kids to do both. You know, one of the beautiful things is that uh... – you're right there in the heart of our city and the heart mm -hmm. of where a lot of work needs to be done. Carver right in the center of the ninth ward. And yeah. uh, you grew up in the ninth ward. You've ventured out and made your way on back there and have dedicated yes. your life to, uh, to building up the neighborhood. And, and we need yes. more, more people like you. And, you know, that leads me to the first question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've had a rash of crime lately. It's been really bad the last, year or so and uh and so i wanted to hear from you what do you think is the uh root cause of crime in our city uh not just talking about crime but like what do you think is the systemic root of crime in our city yeah that's that's a pretty uh deep deep question and so i'm saying that to say when i look at the root i think it's a uh, it's just a lack of understanding who we are in christ Wow. Our lack of understanding our identity, that we are image bearers, that we are called by God's uh, um, uh, name and that we are created in his image. I think that's what a root of it stems is a loaded question, but it's, it starts with the heart. And I would say a lot of roots of our crime is just people don't know who they are, don't know uh, what our calling and mission is uh, while we're here on this earth. So I think if we can get people to understand you're created in the image of God uh, in his likeness uh, that we can begin to see uh, things begin to shift because as I grew up in a crime I, I realized what it was is people want to find their identity and wow. you find your identity hanging with the people on the corner you're hanging out with the uncle that's uh, running around with the girlfriends hanging out with the relatives that's selling all the drugs and hanging out with your neighbors that have all the fancy cars because of this lifestyle they're living. And so you want to be a part of that. You want to find your identity. You want to find yourself worth in that, you know, because a lot of things have been passed down to a city like ours. Oh, you don't have because of systemic issues, which some of that could be partly true. But ultimately, the truth is we have issues because we're, we need to be reconciled back to God. And so Ooh. when I look at that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you really see in terms of the problem, I mean, you're really looking at it at a, at a deep, the deepest level. It has to do mm -hmm. with identity, has to do with yeah. the sense of a belonging, the yeah. sense of creating our identity by those who we uh, find a sense of belonging. So you're saying mm -hmm. that uh, the root of the crime is that some of the people that end up in a crime life are or getting their identity issues met through the wrong mm -hmm. or the wrong places and that we need to provide other places that they connect to. Is that what right? You're yeah, exactly. Cause you're trying to find your value. And I was once in the streets. I know a lot of friends that was out there and, and I think a lot of people don't really realize how the streets does become family to people. That drug dealer that people frown about, he's doing a good job at taking people under his wing and, and saying, Hey, I got you. I can help you make this money. I can help you make a better life if you just do this, that, and the third. And the moment you get hooked on that life, the drugs that you you, you partake, whether it's crack or whether it's uh, heroin, whether it's weed, that, that's, that does the same thing. It says, hey, just do this and you're going to feel good about yourself. Why? Because if you go home, you know no one cares for you at home. 
You go to school, you know no one knows your lifestyle. They don't care. So, hey, just come do this with us. So we're looking for that identity, and we're looking for that family that gives us the identity. And that's where, you know, we have lost a lot of our youth to the streets. And it's nothing new. It's just more magnified because we have social media. I see. Well, that brings us to question two. And uh, that one is, so what problem is not being effectively addressed that contributes to crime in our city? I think one of the things that we have to get back to redefining what community is. Uh, I, I think that's a big major issue. For example, like you take the school system. So kids are being bused uh, from so many different neighborhoods that go to one school because of this thing called school choice. But what happens is the kids are spending a minimum of 30 minutes on the bus, uh, probably going and coming to school. Then you're on a bus with people you don't live with, you don't kind of commune with, and that breeds a lot of uh, problems because you don't know the people you're with. Uh, I think that's one thing is to redefine what community is compared to what we have now. Because when I grew up uh, early in the, the 80s, like your neighbors was on the same page with your parents. So you knew you had to be inside at a certain time because we understood how much crime was affecting, but you still care for the younger kids. And even the drug dealer would say, hey, your grandmother looking for you, go home. That type of sense of community we have lost uh, now because no one is really looking after each other. So that's why I said, I think number one is redefining what community is. And I would say number two, I think we have to realize is a pandemic that's been plaguing our culture for some time, probably late 80s, mid 80s, some 90s, and that's fatherless homes. Well, you don't have the father there, especially a godly father, chaos is going to exist, right? Because that dad is there to nourishment and establish confidence in the child and bring stability to the family. And now that he's either dead or, or in jail, locked up on drugs, you don't have that father figure in the household to bring discipline and reassure the kids or the young man or the young woman that, hey, dad is here is okay. A model yeah. how to love on moms. And I think number three, what I realized as a result of those things is because uh, our literacy rate in this city is so high. So, so if kids can't read, they won't be able to write. If they can't read, they won't be able to work out uh, math equations that are written down because you can't read. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to do it easy. I'm going to work with my hands. And that's to go get into drugs, go get into fights, get into the community and do the devious things because that's all I know. It comes easy, which leads to my fourth thing is that we're no longer in our city uh, teaching trades, the importance of trades where kid can actually, kids and young adults can actually work with their hands because it's something for a young man and a one, young woman to start a project and see it to completion to get that sense of, that sense of oh, I, I accomplished that. And we, you know, those would be the four areas I would say. So it's so multifaceted in the sense that you can't really say one thing is not being addressed, but there's a breakdown in the family. There's a breakdown mm -hmm. in the community. There's a breakdown in our educational system and not just given the, the basic educational skills to the students. Yeah. And then there's mm -hmm. a breakdown in, uh, say, the next level of vocational uh, development. So it's yes. certainly multifaceted and all that yeah. contributes to an increase in crime, huh? Right, right. And it starts, it's, and then we say it starts at home. And I think that's a scapegoat for the church and for the city leaders that just blame it on the parents, right? We know the issue. So it's time to stop blaming that single mother who's trying her best, who was never invested in herself. And now yeah. we expected her to do something she can't do. And that's where we as the church and business leaders and community people need to surround the families the best that we can and say, hey, we want to offer something really tangible, not just saying, let's do this event. Uh, let's let the rap know. No, no, no. This is what we want to focus on, building an infrastructure where community can thrive, where the literacy rate can, can be tackled, and vocational, can, vocational work can be put back to the forefront in our city. So let's uh, look at uh, number three is, you know, what can the citizens do to be part of the solution to crime. 
Uh, what advice would you give to citizens that may be listening to this? How could they be part of the solution? That's that's really a really great, powerful question. I think we have to most definitely uh, network within a community of believers and people who surely just have the heart to want to do well and say, hey, let's get to these elementary schools. Let's develop a coalition of parents and people where we can help tutor, where we can help uh, get into the schools at an early age and give these kids an alternative of a model of what they're not seeing at home, what they're not seeing in the community. Catch them why they're so impressionable and say, hey, even if we at the schools, hey, don't worry about it. we'll build this, this playground for your kids. We just want to come in and read once a week to the kids. You know, I think those uh, um, that is one effective way that we could do that and get ahead of the curve around, uh, rather than watching our kids get to middle school and can't read, high school they can't read, and then it's almost like now we're trying to play catch up. So how do we equip teachers, encourage local teachers not to give up and be a part of the solution and, and engage? And then I say, secondly, how do we take that same inroad and find out what do parents need? Because you have some parents that really want to, they just don't have the know-how or they don't have the inroad. You have very few parents that's just strung out and that don't care. Now, our culture wants us to believe is that a lot of parents don't care. Some parents are trying their best they just don't know what to do to help their kids. Mm. But if we can give them alternative uh, at a young age, something as simple as, hey, how about you try this music by a Grammy-winning artist named Lecrae, who never said anything about sex, drug, money, and murder, and he won a Grammy, right? How about you check out his whole team? Because you have a lot of, uh, just offer people alternative on what's else out there, supposed to just going with the flow. So that's one thing I would say, um, and, I, and I think just for us as citizens, we got to be get back to being bold. We can't just watch crime happen, and we don't jump in. Yeah. Yes, we have to be smart about it, but I think it's ways that we can say, you know, hey, don't do this. Don't you know? We can we can jump in the middle of a lot of things because a lot of these guys that's committing a crime, they're not trying to be murderers. They're not trying, they're just young and hurting and trying to have fun. They just don't realize that that fun is coming at a cost. Yeah. So how do we be bold and be vigilant and help the police department by taking some of our time and say, hey, we're going to watch this neighborhood right here where there's a lot of crime. We'll pay to put up cameras. We'll do neighborhood watches. We'll hang out, throw block parties throw events, you know, that way you're taking ownership of your neighborhood. So when these individuals who are just lost looking to get into something, they can see that this community is thriving. Either I want to be a part of it, or I can't go in that community because these people are very vigilant. They out and about and they're loving on their neighbors. So yeah, that's, that's some of what I see. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So really get involved, uh, see how you can involve, build relationships, uh, mm -hmm. build relationship with police. And, and actually, not that you're the parent of your neighborhood, but to just get involved when you see things and not, not yeah. just sit back and watch. Huh? Yeah, that, we just can't ignore it. Because I, I like what Martin Luther King said, to sit back and go along with an unjust system is to be a part of that system. Wow. And it's too much that crime that we're watching happen and we're just spectating. Yeah. We're too afraid to step in. And so we're watching women get hurt and men just standing up there watching. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Let's not be afraid to be a modern day hero. We don't have to wait for the police. We don't have to wait for the, the you know, and it's just run to it head first in Jesus' name. You're not going to do this crime. And most of these guys are going to flee away because they're not intentionally wanting to hurt somebody. Now, when there's that gunfire, that type of stuff, that's more intentional or they know who they want to kill. Yeah. Right? That's something totally different. But this carjacking and those things like that, that's just us just with our heads in the cloud and not being vigilant to pay attention to what's going on. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. like the kids that happened the other day with the 73-year-old woman, they wasn't armed. People saw them. People just ignored it. Right. Yeah. And we got to get back to being bold in this country and stand up to, to, to tyrants. And then we'll find out it's really not that many people doing it. It's yeah. a small pocket of them small that pocket. we can address them. And then the third thing I would say, 
okay, once justice happened, they go to jail. Let's not just, oh, oh they, they're going to pay for their crime. Let's go visit them in jail and say, hey, we care about you. We want to see you truly be restored. We want to visit them. We want to set up the same way we want to do pre-maintenance. We want to do post-crime too and say, hey, can I help? Can I come to you and read a book to you once a week? Can I just come pray over you once a week? Can I start setting up and helping you make a business plan once you paid your price and you back into society? How can we help you with a business plan? Oh, you like the well? Oh, you like to do these things? Let's start setting up something where, hey, so we can actually help the jail system rehabilitate these individuals who go in there. Because there's really not many people that is truly evil. I just yeah. think people have some hard times that they fell on and they got stuck in a vicious cycle and it's hard to break that curse. So let's catch them yeah. in elementary, let's be bold, and let's visit them in prison, man. Yeah, it seems to me that a, 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 a similar theme that's going through all that you're sharing with us is to to be bold, to make relationship with people, yeah. especially the people that are, that are different than who we are, uh, to be bold about just reaching out and uh, making relationship and, yeah. and connecting yeah. and to do that for, for those that uh, regardless of, of where they are, if they're on our side of the tracks, other mm -hmm. side of the tracks, mm -hmm. in prison, not in prison, uh, to not be scared that we're, we're really dealing with human beings, yes. and that human beings that are neglected, that don't feel loved, that don't feel cared for, are going to act out in some way. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. who's going to be the one that steps up and extends a hand and expresses Amen. care and love yeah. towards another? And that's that's what you're saying that no matter whether they're, they're young, whether they're adolescent, whether they're older, that that needs to happen. Let's move to uh, we, Before we move on, I would just yeah. say just simply, we got to apply the scripture. When Jesus said, look after the orphans and widows. Yeah. Right. That are what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a lot of orphan kids. That's good. Yeah. So let's meet them where they're at. Let's Because a lot of these kids coming out of foster care. We can get a list of people who have foster care and say, hey, can we come once a week and have a Bible study with you and your foster kids, right? Because most of them are in foster care are uh, being uh, parented by a single mom, right? So how do we as a church and as business owners, we create an atmosphere where we say, hey, we get the list of it. Hey, we got this for you as a parent. We know you have all the kid offerings, offerings in your household. And hey, we got this we want to set up once a week, once a month, however it is. And we just want to come alongside you and love on you and your kid. Uh, and we want to do our best to support you. That's so good. Well, let's look at uh, last question number four. How can the citizens of New Orleans help you uh, do your job? Yeah, well, I love networking with people. I would encourage people. So I run a book club at Carver High School. If anybody heard of The Pilgrim's Progress, it's a book from the 1600s by John Bunyan. A friend of mine named Judah Ben. He took that book and put it into urban context and he called it the Cairo Project. All right, so it has a book called uh, The Journey of an Urban Pilgrim. It's the, the first book and the sequel is called The Homecoming. And it's put into urban context. It's like a role play, like an allegory and the kids love it. And I read it to them. Uh, each lunch I read the book. So I got freshmen all the way up to seniors. In the first two years, we go through the first book. In the junior, senior year, we go through the second book and they love it. Everything that we just talked about on this call, the character Cairo faced all those obstacles. He did the drugs, he did the girls, he did the stolen cars, but God got a hold of him because a wow. preacher met him in jail. A preacher met him when he was at his lowly, and the preacher shared the, the gospel with him in a way as if Jesus was standing right next to him and they was best friends. And wow. that blew Cairo away. So Cairo got on his journey to get rid of this burden, and he realized once the burden was rolled off his back, now, God said, now you got to go back to your community. So we can help by hitting the college campus. I mean, college, but high school campuses. Just come see what we're doing. And let's pray and replicate this in other high school. Let's encourage other leaders in the community. Say, hey, take this job for two or three years in the school so you can learn a relationship, build a relationship with the family, the kids, and staff, and say, hey, I want to make a difference by doing this book club. It's a wonderful book. So. For me, how people can get involved, 
just, you know, obviously shoot me a text or email. I would say, come to campus, come meet people, come see what we're doing. And then like, you know, and it's networking. So in my book club, as well as my life skill academy that I'm leading over there, I'm teaching entrepreneurship. I got this phrase that I tell kids, I want you to have a duplex mentality and not a single family home. Because I know one of the the biggest things for our kids in this urban school is that we uh, we have a renter's mentality and I'm trying to teach them a homeowner's mentality. Like we own nothing and I'm trying to teach them how to own and build generational wealth. So if you start off with a duplex, you're never paying a mortgage. Your renter can pay the mortgage for you. And then that's how you build generational wealth. So people think just because I'm doing a book club, that but I'm teaching them about entrepreneurship, about a vision, about a plan for their life. So I'm literally trying to walk through life with them, teach them the gospel, teach them how to manage their help, teach them how to manage relationship, also teach them how to start a business and run a business as well. So, you know, people can reach out and be, you know, come be a part of what we're doing at campus and uh, see, like, for example, like we have a $10,000 matching grant on the table and we're looking for a hundred people that want to donate a hundred dollars that'll help us raise 10 grand. And then we got that grant that's going to be matched. Now here's the kicker. That's what I want people to catch too. That grant is going to help us uh, renovate our van, which is a little rust bucket, but it's also one of the things I'm looking forward to most is going to help us create internships for high school students to work with our church over the summer when they graduate from high school. They're going to specifically work with our farm. So we have 20 acres of land out there by my dad. All right. And so we're looking to buy some saddles and some more bridles because we have eight horses. And we've been getting people out of the city to come to Amy, Louisiana, which is about an hour away from New Orleans. And when I tell you, I haven't had one person to come to that farm and be disappointed yet. They come for the first time and learn how to ride a horse. And they always leave blown away saying, I didn't know how much peaceful this was. I didn't realize the trees smell like this. To give people opportunity to get out of their context and come be a part of this farm has been awesome. So that's just a few ways. I mean, I got a bunch of them, but like, uh-huh. come be a part of book club. Come see what we're doing. If we know businessmen, business people, business women in the city that say, hey, I want to do something. I just don't know what to do. Hey, tell them come holler at me at Carver. We're trying to build an empire over there where we can teach these young kids how to come out of high school, ready to own a home or start a business that can thrive and build generational wealth. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, you and April are, Holly, Cam, and I, y'all one of our heroes. You know, y'all are boots on the ground doing the work. And if we had more of you, you guys in our city, our city would be a lot better and safer mm-hmm. place. So sure. I just bless you and bless all the work that you're doing. And uh, I'm so glad to be connected with you. And so, you know, if you're watching this and you'd like to get uh, involved in some way, you know, contact us. We'll get you connected to Richard. Uh, go see what they're doing at Carver. It's just it's a it's a diamond in, in the, the center of the Ninth Ward. And uh, the work that Richard's doing with his students and uh, the community, you know, all the things he's talking about is is uh, developing a sense of community, developing a covering, developing a sense of belonging and righteousness, uh, challenging the kids to, uh, to, live, to live righteously. All those okay. things that he's talking about is actually being done. And so we just need to expand his work. But thank you so much for taking some time to be with us. And um, let me just say this before we stop is... Uh, we're, we'll be interviewing leaders throughout New Orleans. And if you'd like to watch some other interviews of other leaders, please do so by clicking on the link below. And we wish God's blessing upon you. And we wish God's blessing upon our wonderful city. Amen. Amen.